Uh, hello, people. Uh, welcome. Uh, fantastic to see so many people here. Uh, a lot of us, I think, have been missing the in-person machine learning meetups uh, for a while. So uh, welcome. I'm Andrew from Graphcore. And um, it was amazing when Kumo uh, suggested to us that they might be in town and we could do this joint event. Uh, so we're super excited to have uh, Matthias and Jure here uh, to tell us about Graph Neural Networks and Kumo. And then um, some people will Graphcore will tell you some stuff. And then we can go back upstairs, bring your warm clothes, and we'll have a lovely sunset over London. Uh, without further ado, uh, welcome to Matthias. And uh, fantastic to hear from you. Thank you. Um, yeah, hi, and welcome. Uh, amazing to see so many people here. Uh, I hope you can hear me good. Um, and yeah, uh, this presentation will be on amplifying your GNN or graph neural networks workflow. And I will start with a basic introduction into GNNs and how they really can uh, accelerate machine learning on graphs. Uh, I will introduce PyGE uh, and talk about best practices and challenges. Uh, I see that the layout is a bit screwed up, but don't worry. Um, and then Yuri will go from here and talk about the Kumo GNN enterprise platform and how it integrates PyG into an enterprise platform. And so, um, as you probably know, most real world data can be represented as a graph. And the good thing about graphs is that the uh, data structure of nodes and edges that connect these nodes together is so general that uh, we can formalize many machine learning problems with that. So we have seen applications, social networks, knowledge graphs, traffic, molecules, and many, many more. So it's good to know about graph neural networks and how you can apply them to your own problems. And so traditionally, machine learning on graphs uh, has always been very, very hard, especially because machine learning traditionally assumes like fixed size structures. And so the general procedure is that we have a problem formulation, um, and then we think about ways to engineer features that kind of represent the graph we are operating on. And so natural questions arise such as how can we capture network structure? How can we combine these network structures uh, with att attributes attached to nodes and edges? And then how can we use these features to perform machine learning on graphs on different levels, such as nodes, edges, or graphs? And importantly, that all involves like many, many tools and libraries that you need to be familiar with um, to get started with that. And so one approach to do that um, is kind of like pre-processing node features. And that means we could collect features to capture network structures, such as node degree, uh, node centrality measures, uh, clustering coefficient, uh, and graph that's motives, and so on. So you look, um, look at a node and try to capture local patterns of the graph in a pre-processing set. And while that worked well for some time, um, it has like many, many drawbacks. And the first drawback is that it's kind of really arbitrary. So we predefine how our features look like independent of the task we really want to capture. Uh, they're also expensive to compute and we kind of lose signal that way um, because we're not inputting the raw graph into our machine learning model, but we actually preprocess that and just use the features that we think that are good for the underlying task. It's also kind of tricky to integrate features uh, of nodes and edges attached to those um, uh, because there's no clear way to combine like edge features that you have on your graph uh, if you're just inputting like node feature representations. Um, the other way that was uh, kind of successful uh, a while as well, and you will probably know, uh, is the usage of node embedding techniques um, such as shallow embeddings. So um, that refers to the line of research regarding deep walk and no to back. And these shallow embedding approaches are based on random walk, and they are based on the intuition that nearby nodes in the graph should map to nearby, um, nearby embeddings in the underlying embedding space. And so you train that in, uh, with a contrastive loss, like a word to back, like objective function where you push embeddings close together that are nearby in the graph. Uh, and then you use these node embeddings for an underlying machine learning. And the drawback here is that it's really hard to scale in particular because we are learning a node embedding 
for each node in our graph, which can get expensive if we're talking about millions or billions of nodes. Um, the underlying objective function that we're using here is an unsupervised loss. That means it does not necessarily uh, uh, re re uh, refer to the task we're actually trying to tackle, uh, and it's transactive by nature. And that means that we can use that technique here to apply that to unseen nodes or graphs. So we always have to retrain that whenever a new node comes in. And it's also tricky here, uh, as well as in the preprocessing technique to integrate attributes. Uh, with that, there was a rise uh, in machine learning once neural message passing graph neural networks come into play. Um, and neural message passing uh, GNNs are basically introduced by the intuition that we perform message passing. So a node um, sends messages, for example, their features, to all nearby nodes, and these nodes will receive messages and aggregate them together to enrich their own node feature representation. And that scheme is so general that, that I like to see it as some form of generalization of any neural network architecture. And so it actually defines a new paradigm of how we define neural networks. In particular, we use that scheme here of neural message passing to go from convolutional neural networks to graph neural networks in the way that we are not um, aggregating information from discrete neighborhoods, but we allow arbitrary neighborhoods that are, are randomly um, arbitrarily uh, positioned in space. And we can also see graph neural networks as a generalization of the transformer architecture where we are operating on a fully connected graph and then using attention um, to pass messages across different neighbors or different nodes. Um, so graph neural networks apply representation learning to graphs. And that means we're actually learning a representation here that is useful for the underlying downstream task in an end-to-end -end fashion. And so since we're not longer pre-computing features, we are using the raw graph as input instead. We can actually learn embeddings that capture fine granular details of our for the underlying task. And we can Due to its generality, we can easily integrate heterogeneous features as well, so different node types, um, node type differently sized uh, features, and so on. And the most important thing here is that neural networks are actually proven to be uh, kind of flexible across different tasks and objectives. So we can provide self losses uh, and accelerate our our uh, main supervised loss. Um, the idea here is. As I, as I already said, um, we learn how to optimally use information from neighbors to and obtain enhanced node representation. And so we start with a graph here shown on the left, and then we have a target node. That, that is the node we are interested in learning a representation for. And then we have build a computation graph here as shown on the right that aggregates information from the no local neighborhood. And so how we aggregate this information is actually defined by little small neural networks that are then stacked together into our GNN package. And so overall, it is a great, uh, great year to learn about GNNs, uh, especially because neural networks have been proven to be very, very scalable, can really uh, reason uh, on, on complex and large scale data. And the same holds true for graph data as well. Uh, we can actually reason across multiple hops, so it, it's very, very hard to pre-compute this information as input features, and so um, graph neural networks are a good way uh, to capture that. We are actually learning representations here, so we're not manually feature engineering features and uh, manually engineering features, and so our representations actually capture the characteristics of our data. And the most beautiful thing is that it's actually so we can pre-train or train the graph neural networks and then uh, apply that same trained GNN on an ever-evolving graph. And so it naturally generalizes to unseen nodes and graphs. And so um, with that, I would like to introduce PyG or Python Geometric. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with that, um, but I give a quick overview and, and some of the recent highlights we added 
uh, we have PyTorch uh, geometric reasonable. And the premise of PyG is that we want to bundle the state of the art in graph representation learning uh, and make that accessible um, through a, a wide community. And so we want to both um, uh, accelerate research so that researchers can directly make use of, of latest models and compare their own work with that, build upon that. Um, but we also want to make it accessible to industry um, so that latest research can be directly uh, deployed there. And so PyG bundles layers, architectures, and many, many examples that help you get started with GNN. So it's fully open source, uh, and I'm especially proud of, of many, many contributors. Um, we are over 350 by now, uh, and it's amazing to see that we could uh, encourage so many people to contribute to PyG. Um, and now, PyG is a collaboration between universities uh, and our own startup called Kumo AI, and we also put uh, Win Nvidia and Intel and also Graphcore um, to contribute um, to the exciting repository. So the main components of PyG are as follows. So first, it bundles graph-based neural network building blocks. And that means we have a lot of message passing layers implemented, um, derived from latest research. There's an interface to create new message passing layers. Uh, we also added normalization layers, <laughs> readout layers, and so on. And you can all stack them and combine them together to define your own custom GNN. Um, we have full support for graph storage uh, data structures, uh, provide predefined data sets you can directly download and use. And we added support for data loaders such that you can easily create mini batches um, depend independent of the path you actually trying to solve. So um, with that, uh, we also added heterogeneous graph support. We now provide access to over 200 benchmark data sets, and there are over 10 different sampling techniques um, that you can play with. Um, then we graph augmentations, and you can use these to augment your graph. You can use these to um, uh, transform your graph, such as adding self loops, uh, adding meta paths, and so on, uh, which especially comes in handy on heterogeneous graphs. Uh, we have missing feature value imputation support so that you can uh, easily uh, learn on, on graphs that may have missing features, which uh, which comes in handy on real world data sets. And you can use PyG to even learn on meshes or point clouds, but just, uh, just by transforming these data structures into a graph and then using message testing on top to learn from that. Yeah, I'm sorry, the slides are a bit uh, weird. But, um, and then the most important point is that I see PyG as a central starting place to get started with GNNs in a practically fashion. And that means we provide videos, call-ups, blog posts, and so on. And these should help you to get started with GNN in a practical fashion. We also added application-driven graph machine learning tutorials. So when we're in, uh, depending on the task you're trying to solve, you can directly find the corresponding blog post about that. With that, I would like to introduce three important highlights, at least for me, uh, that make it, that we recently added by G. And one of those is called PyGLib, which is our new low-level uh, and unified GNN engine that drives all the low-level needs of PyG, such as efficient uh, heterogeneous GNN compute. Uh, so with that, uh, we no longer rely on external packages that are called Torch Scatter and Torch Sparse. So they have been fully upstream to vanilla PyTorch, and our only dependency left is this new PyGLib. Um, dependency created by us. And as you can see on the right, um, these accelerations from PyGLib help tremendously in accelerating all the different needs. We also uh, added new extended capabilities in PyGLib, and that means that we completely revamped our explainer interface, and we have now a unified interface to explain any DNN out of the box using different explainer algorithms. And the beauty of that is that it works both on homogeneous and heterogeneous graphs. 
Uh, it supports both general explainers such as integrated gradient, uh, shapely values, and so on. But it also easily supports like dedicated explainers designed for GNNs such as GNN explainer or PG explainer. And that all interface, this whole interface also comes with support for visualization. So you really uh, visualize uh, feature important scores. You can visualize important graphs and so on and metric computations. So you can justify that one GNN explain algorithm is better than another on your specific task. With the recent release of PyTorch 2.0, we also added full support for that into our recent release. And PyTorch 2.0 basically introduced the compilation support, uh, which makes your GNN run faster by JIT compiling that into an optimized kernel. And the beauty of that is that everything basically stays the same. All you need to do is run torch.compile on top of that, and that just makes your GNN just run faster by um, Just to give you a quick example, overall, in our benchmarks, we see speedups to nearly um, 300%, uh, which is kind of cool, and we're actively working on, on um, enhancing the feature set with more models and more use. Um, with that, I would quickly introduce the basic pipeline of PyG and especially out, outline some of the challenges we see with that. And since PyG is so modular, um, you can basically swap out any of these building blocks just by, for example, creating a new data set, but everything else stays, stays the same. And so the first step in any PyG pipeline is basically to create and instantiate your graph data set. Um, and PyG expects a graph in either COO or CSR format, and you can use that to model complex heterogeneous graphs with that. So you can define new node types, new edge types, and just um, attach any attribute to it that you may have in your in your role data. Um, the challenge with that, or better speaking, in academic graphs, we are usually work on the already they are ready to use. But if you're in an industry setting, then that may be a blocker for you because now you're responsible for building your own graph. And so you may have hit problems such as what is the best graph design that I have to use for message casting? Because you want to have important information nearby to your target node. And so you may, may need to adjust the graph to account for that. And then you may see problems where you need best practices for feature selection of feature engineering because features are probably heterogeneous and uh, can be of any data type, but uh, neural networks usually require to input continuous features. Um, with that, um, once you have your PyG data set defined based, based on best practices, um, you can basically tackle any graph related machine learning task. But you are also responsible uh, for creating your own training layer. That means that in academic graphs, we usually have these training labels and data set splits predefined for us. Um, and that is just for the reason of maximum reproducibility uh, across research. Um, but in the industry graph setting, um, you usually are responsible for creating your training labels and data set splits as well. And so natural questions arise such as, how can we actually obtain these labels from our graph? How, what are best practices on avoiding data leakage in these, in these scenarios? And how shall I split my graph such, such that it naturally uh, models the real world application we are interested in? And in that case, random, link, random splitting may not be the best choice. After that, um, you, are, sorry, um, you are responsible for creating a data loader. And that means this data loader defines how your data set, uh, of how you obtain mini batches from your data set and input that into a graph machine learning pipeline. And PyG scales the data larger than GPU, uh, VRAM, um, using, um, subgraph sampling and integrate over dozens of different sampling types, such as node-wise sampling, layer-wise sampling, and so on. Um, when you may have its, um, blockers, uh, when you actually want to scale your data um, that may not even fit on a single machine. So you're responsible 
for moving these data structures out of form for independent scale up. And then afterwards, you are responsible for creating your GNN model. And that means that you can either use predefined GNN models available in Python that are built based on state of the art practices, or you can use all these different building blocks and your own path in GNN. And if that's not sufficient for you, you can even extend PyG based on all the interfaces it provides to create your GNN. And then you are responsible for implementing and training, uh, implementing the training and inference processes. But that usually follows vanilla PyTorch uh, functionality. So you iterate over your data, you move that to the GPU, you use the forward pass um, to obtain the loss, compute the gradients um, using using that loss, uh, and then apply um, gradient descent on top of that to move your way to the right direction. And so the beauty of that is that PyG supports all of that and fully is fully customizable from model architecture to training routine. Um, but there's no general rule of thumb on what is the best model architecture for a given data or a given task. And so natural questions arise such as, what is the best DNN for my task and how should I design it? How many message passing layers shall I need to capture long range information and to avoid overfusing and stuff like that? Um, you may have a data set that has a high class imbalance uh, or you see heavy overfitting um, and you may encounter or need to find ways to counteract with that. Um, you may find that your model may not generalize over time and it's not clear how to really um, uh, mitigate that. And then you may see poor performance. You may think about free training or self provision of salary to counteract with that. With that, um, I'm happy to hand it over to Yuri. Um, let's now talk and he will now talk about how Kumo solved all these problems using IG under the hood. Uh, great. So um, also really excited uh, to be here and thank you, Matthias, for uh, uh, presenting PyG. And uh, as you saw, it's uh, it's amazing technology that's uh, heavily non-trivial um, and really requires a very skilled uh, operator. So. Uh, graph neural networks um, um, are are very interesting, very flexible. PyG is an amazing tool to build them and train them, uh, but they require a very a very skilled uh, person or an operator. So, if now with Matthias's talk about how do you build these mod these models, the question is how do you, how do you put them in production, right? So, what do I do if I actually want to use this in practice to make predictions for you know to make my business better? And if you do that, then basically there is a lot you have to build um, around the PyG library. Um, and in this slide, I'm trying to show that basically what you have to do by yourself, which is great to give you a lot of flexibility and customizability, is the feature engineering and feature encoding, defining the graph um, around your problem formulation. You need to then figure out how you are going to train and evaluate the model. Um, after you have done that, you need to have the inference pipeline um, and any explainability that we integrated into PyG, and then also find out the best architecture. And after you've done that, now you also need a way to construct the graph and have some kind of graph storage, graph database that you are going to use. Um, there might be a way for you to bring in custom features and lay them out on top of the graph. You need uh, you know, to manage the machine learning life cycle um, and also worry about putting things in production, have the pipelines. If you have multiple users, data scientists working on things, you want to take care of security, who has access to what, model versioning, and all that. So what happens in Kumo is that in Kumo, we built a distributed system, highly scalable and efficient, where all these components have been built out for you. So if you want to use the power of graph neural networks, you can do that very easily and very quickly um, and uh, uh, get your predictions out um, um, as quickly as possible. So what I'm going to do next is kind of, I'm going to talk you through what is Kuma, how we think about it, how do you access it uh, as an engineer, as a data scientist, uh, and how do you then put those models, how do you build them, and how do you put them in production? So in a graph machine learning workflow, here is the way to think of this, right? It has several different steps. So there is a step where you define the graph 
and then you have to need you need some capability to actually build the graph to materialize it. After you have built the graph, you need to decide what are the features attributes that are going to be attached to the nodes and edges. So again, you need some data processing system that allows you to now build this graph with features um, attached to the nodes. Now that you have done that, you need some heterogeneous graph storage. You need some, you know, let's call it graph database or something like that, where you are going to kind of have that graph so you can access it. After you, you have now uh, have a graph storage layer, um, now in GNNs, there is this problem of uh, creating mini batches. So you need to be able to do this um, subgraph sampling, this breadth per search type subgraph sampling uh, very quickly so that you send those small subgraphs onto the GPU where uh, PyG is going to um, train train your model. And then after you've done that, now you have your model. Now every night or every hour, you have to now repeat this process to, to do inference and make predictions uh, for the entities uh, that you uh, care about. So um, where we start with Kumo is that you don't even have to think about kind of graphs. We start from a relational schema. So we generalize GNNs and Kumo to operate on the relational tables. So what, what we realize is that for whatever business you are, your most valuable data is stored in a data warehouse in a relational schema, which means in a set of tables that are connected through primary foreign key uh, relations between, uh, between them, right? And the uh, insight is that these schemas, they are graphs and they are not even, they are not graphs at the um, um, table level, but really they are graphs at the individual record le level, right? So if you take your data in your tables, you can very naturally represent that data as a uh, richly labeled heterogeneous graph, or what we do in Kumo is heterogeneous hypergraph. But you can basically take that and represent all your entities in your business, all your relations as a, as a large graph. So then the way Kumo relates to the PyG is you can think of PyG as a spark plug, right? To drive somewhere, you need a spark plug. But Kumo is the provides an entire engine. Now, if you'd like to build an engine by yourself, it's great. It takes time and resources, but you can do that. Or you can use Kumo that provides basically all the functionality around that makes this um, very, very easy uh, to use. So I'm going, the way I'm going to present what we are doing is through this um, uh, kind of a case study of a, a data set coming from H&M uh, or H&M, which is a big uh, European clothing retailer. Um, and the data set we are going to use is uh, comes from uh, Kaggle, and it's um, a simple schema. It's users, sales, and products. And in you can use much more complicated schemas, much bigger data sets. But you know, let's look this one. So um, this is and now the question is, how can I apply graph learning to this uh, to this data set that has users, sales, uh, and products? And uh, users have IDs, products have certain features. Um, and sales have also certain features like time and so on. So um, the way you do you work in Kumo is that first you register your schema, right? So you come in and you say, here is a set of tables. This is how they are related to each other. And this is a set of columns that, that those tables have. So we basically register the data you want to use uh, for machine learning. Um, then that uh, that now that you have registered the data, now you have to specify the machine learning problem. Um, and in Kumo, we developed um, this high-level declarative uh, machine learning problem specification language that we call predictive query. So it's like a SQL-like language where you can very quickly define what is your prediction problem. And the way prediction problems are defined, they are defined by two things. They are defined by the target variable and what entities that target variable uh, applies to. So in this case, for example, um, here is here's an example of a predictive query. It says predict not exist sales between now and 90 days into the future where exists sales, you know, minus 90 to zero. So in the last 90 days for each user ID. So what this is defining, it's saying for users who had um, um, sales in the last 90 days, uh, predict whether there will be uh, no sales in the next 90 days, right? So based on this, what Kuma is going to do it's going to automatically create a training data set and training label uh, and, and target labels. Um, so this means based on this, we take this query specification when, and we interpret it to generate training labels from the past data 
across multiple timestamps so we are able to build models. Kuma, Kuma will also automatically determine the best training strategy. Um, basically, what is the underlying machine learning task that, um, that is defined by this uh, predictive query? Um, and the predictive query language is very, very expressive. So you can, you can be asking, you know, this kind of churn type questions. You can build a recommender system using this least distinct operator where I'm saying predict least distinct product IDs between now and seven days into the future for each user ID. Um, I can be asking predict the sum of sales in the last, ni last 90 days. I can do various types of things. We can also do what if type analysis uh, and so on. And what our engine does, it, it takes this um, predictive query specification and has a number of different machine learning tasks at the back end where this gets translated into one of those machine learning tasks. Um, what is important here is that Kumo really understands time. So in a lot of these examples here, time is super important, right? So that you don't have information leakage because these events happen in time so you cannot learn from the future. And usually machine learning pipelines, time, like there is all these issues with time consistency, time correctness, information leakage. Here we don't have that because time is the is a first class uh, is a first class citizen. Otherwise you have to take of this manually and it just leads to a huge number of bugs. Um, so now that you have defined your uh, predictive query in this uh, declarative language, you can basically have as many of these queries over, over your graph, over your schema as you would like. You can predict something about the users. You can predict something about the stores. You can predict something about the transactions. You can be predicting demand uh, forecasting on the products, all from this, um, all from this schema that you have, uh, that you have registered. Uh, so what Kuma is going to do, right? It's going to out ingest all your relational uh, tables and it's going first to build a heterogeneous hypergraph for you. So from your tables, we are going to build automatically a graph uh, at the entity level. So this means that Kumo interprets connections through fact tables as hyper edges um, and also optimizes the, struct the structure of this graph for you by collapsing many to many tables. So for example, in this case of uh, H&M, because it's a simple schema, it's just people connected to transactions connected to products, but there can also be a social net between people and um, anything uh, else you would like. And what we also do is we connect tables that are far away to kind of bring that signal closer to the target node so that um, the graph neural network has easier time uh, to learn. Now that we have built the graph, what Kumo then does takes your predictive query and basically creates a data set, a training data set for you. So it creates labels um, that are that are time consistent. And then when you are making predictions, you are basically going now to train a GNN that predicts the label for every entity of interest based uh, on the graph structure. And what is nice here is that because of the GNN will kind of go this way, but then it will wrap back, you basically also get some of this collaborative filtering type of effect that the GNN can learn, which is super useful for recommender systems and things like that. Okay, so now that uh, Kumo created the graph for you, created the training data set for you, now you need to um, decide. Now you need to train the model, or you need to decide on your architecture. And we have two ways to do that. First way we we have to do that is we have developed a few shot auto ML strategy for GNNs, which we call uh, uh, auto transfer, and we have a high clear paper presented, uh, what, in two weeks in, in, in Ghana, the paper will be presented, where basically we are able to do um, knowledge transfer between different GNN architectures, so we are very quickly able to find a good architecture for your problem. We need to train about three models to find a really good one. Uh, while, you know, this kind of Bayesian optimization, neur um, uh, neural architecture search strategies need 20, 30, 50 uh, models to get anywhere. So, so um, but uh, we have a much better way of doing that. So you can do this, uh, or you can kind of craft your own modeling plan, which basically means your own architecture and and all the uh, and everything else by as a data scientist by basically setting various parameters. So because we work on the relational data, the same way as you know in a database, you have a way to you have a query execution plan, we have a modeling plan, and you can kind of edit that default modeling plan uh, however you like, and that's. Um, uh, that gives you uh, a lot of uh, flexibility. 
Um, right? So either you do things through um, AutoML using the paper that, uh, evaluated here, uh, or you can do uh, you can you you have more control over the process um, if you would like to do that, and you get options around you know data splitting strategies and ratios, any kind of upsampling and downsampling, evaluation metrics, uh, any fine tuning, early stopping, and things like that. Um, now, if you'd like more, in the you also have GNN design space options where you can basically in a in a very nice way define the parameters of your architecture, right? So you don't have to kind of worry about tensors, their dimensionalities, and things like that, but you can basically specify uh, in this kind of design space way how your uh, GNN uh, will look like, how deep it will be, what aggregate, ag aggregators you are going to use, um, and so on. So that's um, that's what is kind of supported for uh, data science. Now, in, in terms of our uh, Kumo GNNs that we are using internally, I would say they are basically, they go beyond state of the art, right? Everything that state of the art is implemented in PyG, we have models that kind of go, uh, go beyond that and are optimized for these heterogeneous hypergraph use cases where you really want to model the, the richness and the heterogeneity uh, of your data. This means that in, with Kumo kind of the, 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 there is a, there is a kind of change of thinking whether the data scientist is not, you know, in engineering features and, and coming up with cleverer and cleverer features that are measuring, you know, all kinds of different things, but really thinking about how do I design a machine learning task? What's my business problem? What's the downstream objective? What data will I use? And let the neural network do the representation learning feature engineering for you. Um, right. So in Kumo, basically our models achieve state of the art on, on, um, on any, on a relational database type, uh, machine learning tasks. And as I said, if you have a rich schema, you can be asking a lot of different predictive queries or train a lot of different models over, over the same schema. You know, something about predicting what products users are going to buy, how active is user going to be, will they churn? Um, all this can be kind of asked over the same schema. And when you are making a prediction about the users, you are really kind of using the entire your business data. So wherever the signal is, the graph neural network uh, is going to find it and bring it uh, to the target node. Um, one thing that we worked quite hard is uh, on what we call uh, node encoding or feature encoding. As Matthias said, uh, GNNs, uh, generalized CNNs, even like a transformer, you can think of it as a limited, uh, uh, limited version of a graph neural network. So this allows that you can bring in a lot of different multimodal data. And what, what happens in industrial use cases is that your data is very rich and you have to encode it so that the neural network is able to process it. So in Kumo, we have a rich set of different encoders um, that, allow, that allow you to quickly say, use this encoder for this uh, type of data. We do a lot with time. So we have very rich encoders to account for time, both to kind of have this kind of positional encoding, we capture periodicities um, and things like that. And we also have image and text encoders that, um, that, that work uh, really well. Um, then another thing I will say that is important is that with um, our technology, uh, first, notice that there is no feature engineering, right? You just bring your raw data, your raw tables, and uh, the neural network kind of does the rest. So there is no manual uh, feature engineering. Your representations are learned or your features are learned. So your predictive accuracy performance will be much better than what you can manually do. Um, another important thing is that in um, real data is collected over time. So your events, your actions happen over time. And what it means that when you are learning over historical data, historical data, historical events are time stamped. And if you do feature engineering, then it's very easy to be predicting whether I'm, you know, to make a mistake and predict whether I'll pay the loan back from two years ago by using my average account balance this month, right? This kind of time time leakage, information leakage very easily happens when a data scientist develops something, the engineer puts it in production and so on. In uh, Kumo, because time is kind of a first class citizen, you never, we never make, we don't allow for that to happen. So we basically make sure that whenever we learn, we only learn from the past. We never look into the future. It's a, it's a small detail, but, uh, saves you um saves you a lot when there is a hidden bug and your models work really well 
um, offline, but then you put them in production and they don't, and you don't know why. Um, it happened to me quite a few times. Okay, so um, so that's good. And then um, going back to the uh, to the H and M example, here are, here are two predictive queries. One is the basically the lifetime value of a user or number um, um, regression problem of predicting the sum of the purchases in the na next ninety days. And the other one is the churn, basically saying the user won't buy anything or a customer won't buy anything in the next 90 days. Um, and what I show in this table is uh, two things, is the two predictive queries. The first one is the mean average precision error. So here lower is better. The second one is area under the precision recall curve. So higher is better. Um, what an analyst would be able to do? What would you do with feature engineering and XGBoost? what kind of PyG graph sage is able to do, and what uh, Kumo graph neural networks um, uh, give you. And you see that gives you better models by, by quite a wide, wide margin. Another thing that's maybe more important is how much code you have to write. And in Kumo, you only need to write like 40 lines. Basically, you have to register your schema, select uh, the, the data types or the encoders for the columns, and write the predictive query. Um, while if you use PyG graph sage, you need to write 600 lines of code. Uh, the amount of time it takes, in Kumo it takes less than an hour, elsewhere it takes a day or two uh, for this relatively small um, data set, right? But the point is, it makes you as a data scientist uh, much more uh, productive. So um, Kumo, um, we have a number of customers. I'll, I'll give you two examples of, of uh, use cases and, and the impact we have. One is, for example, we are working with a uh, ad exchange where they are trying to improve the performance of downstream models. Um, here, um, we, we use cookie data and device data and publishers and all that to build a large heterogeneous graph, um, train uh, GNNs, um, and we got a 0.3 um, improvement in AUC absolute. So a 30% improvement in uh, AUC over where they were, uh, where their internal models were. Um, another example is we work with a, let's call it on-demand uh, marketplace or a big delivery service in US with uh, 100 uh, plus million users. Um, here again, we have data about users, stores, where, where they buy things, uh, all the delivery, all the inventory, things like that. We are here doing a recommendation engine, basically predicting uh, new categories or new stores where users are going to order from. Um, and we got a 50% lift in uh, precision compared to their um, in-house uh, solution. Um, and so that's two, two examples about um, how people use uh, Kumo. What I want to do in the, last, uh, uh, in the last part is to say, to show you a bit more how, how, what did we build and how does it work. So here's our architecture diagram. So Kumo is a software as a service platform um, that that runs in the cloud. And uh, basically, what we, we build it for efficiency and scalability. So we can, we can easily scale to 20, 30, 50 billion um, uh, entities or 50 billion node uh, type graphs, where in our uh, platform, the user accesses it um, either through uh, Python, which is kind of the screenshots I showed you. We also have a very nice easy API, and you can combine the two. Um, and we have a REST API important for um, orchestration and things like that. We have a kind of control plane that without an access control and things like that. Um, then the, the heart of Kumo is this predictive query engine, which is a distributed system for training large scale uh, graph neural networks. Um, and we access the data, we cache some data, but basically on a need basis, we would load the data from your uh, data, Speed, Snowflake, Amazon, uh, S3, uh, wherever you have it. And then what is nice is that after, let's say, the model is trained or predictions are done, they are written back to the data store. We basically materialize predictions as another table um, in, your, in your data warehouse. So now you can use that table for something else or use that as an input to another predictive query. So you can nicely chain and build things uh, together in very interesting uh, ways. So in terms of our our uh, platform it's a uh, elastic uh, heterogeneous compute architecture where the core basically there are four large pieces of it there is a large data processing distributed system that you know creates the graphs materializes them and all that 
And then there is an on-demand um, uh, el el elastic platform that loads this graph and trains the GNN or does the prediction. And the way this platform is, is um, developed is that we have three different types of worker nodes. We have what we call a feature store. This, is, uh, this relies on large-scale SSDs so that we can have a lot of node uh, features and edge features uh, stored and we can access them very quickly. So we are using uh, SSDs for that, for a graph store, for just storing the wiring diagram. So no features, just the wiring diagram. We are using um, large-scale uh, memory machines. Um, and then we have the, the GPU machines where, where the actual model training is happening. And all this has to uh, work in synchrony, right? Like you sample your graphs, you enrich them with features, you send them to the uh, to the GPU machine. Um, and the system is really tuned to do this um, very, very, very performantly. Um, and a lot of um, experience that I got while building, um, you know, PinSage and other things at Pinterest are brought and, and kind of got to the next level um, uh, at Kuma. We also provide some basic MLOps, training orchestration, model management, uh, and things like that. Um, to say um, what we also support and becomes very important is uh, parallel training and graph reuse, right? In our case, you can materialize graph once, but then train a lot of many different models based on the predictive queries you have asked uh, over your graph or over your, your schema uh, that you uh, that you imported. So it's very easy to reuse graphs to quickly tackle uh, new use cases, really quickly kind of iterate and find the right definition of the machine learning problem that, you know, that corresponds to your business use case and uh, business metrics. Um, as I said, one one of the why, why why is it very hard to train graph neural networks is because the the, the graphs are these kind of heterogeneous objects and they are very large. So what you what you have to do to be able to train these big models, you have to do this graph sampling, right? You have to create these small subgraphs that you are then sending to the GPU. And our graph store is optimized. It's a, it's machines with lots of uh, memory, lots of RAM and many cores that are doing this graph sampling so that this is then kind of sent down uh, to PyTorch, Py, Py, Py Python Geometric uh, to actually uh, learn uh, learn the models. Um, we also provide sampling as a service that enables parallel execution of multiple uh, training and inference, inference workloads uh, at the same time. Um, we also, as I said, mentioned earlier, we build a very scalable a feature store that sits on SSDs, um, that's on a separate machine. Um, we were very careful how we organize and lay out the data so that we get high performance when a mini batch is sampled, the node features are attached, and that is then uh, sent uh, sent on to the uh, to the uh, to the GPU machine. Um, so just kind of to close and to summarize what I've been talking about, right? So. If you are a business, your data is a graph, kind of whether you like it or not, right? Your most valuable data sits in a data warehouse, sits in a relational schema, in a set of tables. And, uh, you know, the, the way, the way machine learning is done today is not through feature engineering. The way machine learning is done today is through deep learning. We know how to do deep learning on, on, um, uh, on images, uh, with CNNs. We know how to do deep learning very successfully or representation learning or natural language with transformers, with uh, LLMs. Um, and uh, what Kumo brings, it brings basically the power of deep learning to your relational data. So we are able now to do deep learning over your uh, over your database, right? Um, and the way to do deep learning over a graph or over a database is uh, through graph neural networks, right? So these shallow embeddings like, you know, big graph, node to vec, deep walk, and so on, just won't do it because that's kind of trained with a heuristic, uh, you know, random walk objective function. Here in GNN, you can really fuse the node feature information with the graph structure, learn from the entirety of your data, and supervise these models in an end-to-end -end way, depending on your uh, objective function. Uh, PyG, what Matthias was talking about, is um, by far the most pop world's most popular GNN library, especially popular in schools, um, in research. I teach a course at Stanford about it. Videos are on YouTube. So if you want to go into this and you want to go deep, Py, Py, PyG is the library of choice because it's kind of so beautiful, so extensible, 
and and you can really play uh, play with it. Um, Kumo, on the other hand, um, is a production-based uh, platform that brings the power of GNNs to your uh, to your graph workloads, or even more generally to your relational data. Where Kumo takes care of you know taking your raw, raw data, building the graphs, uh, building the training data, training your models, uh, and giving you the predictions. And all this happens in an end-to-end -end way. You don't have to do feature engineering. You don't have to manage the graph. It's all uh, taken care uh, of you. Which means that you can now very rapidly iterate and get get value out of uh, predictive models. Um, so, if you are interested, uh, please reach out and uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Yuri. Thank you, Matthias. Incredible timekeeping <laughs> in 20 seconds of both talks. Um, so, our schedule now is um, we have a 10 minute break, essentially for people to use the bathrooms, because there's a lot of people, it might take some time. We have time later for discussion. So may I suggest we kind of mill around for 10 minutes. Anyone who needs to use the bathroom, whatever, start doing that. Um, and, uh, but we can take questions, you know, based on the talk now. Yeah, yeah, so to do both, bathroom and questions at the same time. Uh, formal starting again is uh, at 6.30. Uh, so if people have questions for any of us, we'd be happy to take them. Yeah, you want to ask, can you repeat? Deep learning on graph, how deep you? Because usually it's three, four layers. Yes, in more is a problem, right? How deep? Uh, so for these models, how deep they go? It really depends on your graph, right? If your if your graph is a molecule or if your graph is a protein, you want to go much deeper than if graph is a, a small world uh, social network with a very small diameter, right? So if you are working on um, small world type graphs. You go a couple of hops deep. If you work on more geometric, long, you know, chain molecules, things like that, you can go very, very, uh, very, very far. Um, the 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 deepest I think goes about thousand layers. Um, it's implemented in PyG, so you can go thousand layers deep if you like. Nothing to add, really. But uh, in my opinion, it's important to disentangle. Uh, that uh, how many message passing layers you use from the number of hops you sample because you can do bi-directional sampling for example and then you can uh, can go much much deeper with your GNN on the shallow subgraph and that's what we're doing for well. yeah, maybe a first question where does the name Kumo come from and then second what does it mean to have um, first class citizen for time is it a node or what do you, what does that mean Good. Where does the Kumo name from? I, I can tell you a story. Actually, I I had a domain vertex.ai bot, and then two weeks later, somebody announced the Vertex product. Um, you can guess who, right? So we had to come up with a new name, um, and then and then uh, we came up with name Kumo, which means uh, spider or or, uh, or a cloud, depending on what uh, kanji you use in Japanese. And and it's very beautiful because, right? A spider walks the walks the web, so the GNN walks walks the graph, and Kumo is in the cloud, so it's um, it fits really well. Um, and then the second question was about time. Where is the time? Or I didn't maybe get it. Um, what does it mean? Is that your the your graphs are never static. Your entities in the graph have timestamps and and your graph is kind of growing or being added over time so if you will be using the other let's say gnn packages they don't understand time so when you are predicting uh and let's say you are let's say a simple use case could be you are predicting whether person will pay back a loan or not you are a bank right so now you say my training data set is i'll take historical loans and see which ones were paid back or not but these loans were taken at different points in time. Maybe I have taken two loans in the past. I've taken maybe one in 2015 and the other one in 2020. So the graph of transactions in 2015 was very different than in 2020. So when, when you are looking at the graph, it has to be different. And basically the graph is different for every second 
since the beginning of time. So how are you going to solve that? Will you now materialize a separate graph for every second? Or will you say, oh, I'll be a bit sloppy and I'll you know, do it on a midnight of every day? It gets very ugly. In Kuma, you have one graph with all, like the latest graph with all the time timestamps, but Kuma will understand that you are predicting an event that happened in 20, uh, 2015. So you can only learn from the nodes that have a timestamp before the 2015. It's kind of simple, but it makes life, life hugely, hugely easier. Um, yeah, in terms of the predictive queries, I was wondering, you mentioned end-to-end. -end. Do you train different models for each predictive query, or do you train sort of in an unsupervised way and fine-tune it for each of the predictive queries? Um, that's a good question. Um, where we are right now, we are training a separate model for each query um, and really supervise it kind of all the way down. Um, there is, we have a lot of ideas and actually this becomes very beautiful because these GNNs can overlap. So we can simultaneously train models. You can then means that you can kind of pre-train and then get to the, from, you know, the data reach to more the data poor task. There is a lot you can do right now is where we are, but we are moving to kind of joint training, things like that. I have a question about Py, uh, PyTorch geometric. Do you implementing dy dynamic uh, graphs? Um, so temporal graphs in, in PyG is, is still in, in early development. So we have basically all the features integrated for temporal sampling and so on also exposed as part of PyG. Um, so you can, you can use that if you want. Um, but we are actively developing new temporal GNN models as we go. Um, so um, expect more to come soon on that. Hi. Um, thank you, first of all. It's great presentations. Um, I was wondering, you were talking about the different like graph uh, stores, feature stores, the compute. Uh, could you give us an idea of like the scales that you're talking about? How many machines do you need to use? What kind of like, what are the sizes of your data sets for each one of those systems? Is it something that can be limited to like one node or is it, I imagine it depends kind of if you're doing a temporal thing as well, right? But, uh, I'll, I'll be very open. So um, what we are doing right now, we are using uh, large memory machines with let's say a terabyte of memory, um, which means we can do, we can fit, let's say 50 billion uh, node graph on a terabyte memory machine. And for um, for features, we are, we can go as big as uh, as many SSDs as you have. We've been benchmarking with 16 terabytes uh, worth of SSDs. So we can basically process a terabyte size graph and uh, the 16 terabytes uh, worth of features. Um, what we are working on actually at Stanford, uh, it's super exciting. Uh, we are working on an approach that allows us to distribute the graph and train GNNs without machines needing to communicate with each other, which should sound contradictory. Um, so that's great uh, if you are puzzled. Um, so we have we have that research happening, so that will migrate uh, to Kumo as well. Okay, great, and I smile. Yes, I may. Um, the PyG is very message message passing is really at its core. How do you see that impacting like the fact that uh, um, uh, transformer-based GNNs are becoming more and more? Do you see that being? What do you mean in, in, in particular that transformers can be seen as mass passing or what is happening? Yeah, I can. I mean, in, in the end, transformers are GNS. It's just mass passing on the fully connected graph. But in the end, no one sees it that way or implements it that way because a message passing is, is done in a fully connected fashion and then you're not operating or not needing. To operate on sparse matrices or sparse JPG matrices anymore. Um, but yeah, we PyG has all support for fully connected graphs and dense adjacency matrices, and we're actively working on uh, extending our our models to also utilize latest research on graph transformer. Um, I'll take one more. I think there's one from over here. And um, um, Ricky, if you could load up the next slides, please. Thank you. Um, so one of the listed use cases for Kumo was what if 
predictive queries, how would you train a GNN for a what if query, given that the action might not exist in the schema? Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. So what we are using is um, we are using these uh, Kate estimators. Um, these are uh, uh, conditional average treatment effects literature. So basically, we train uh, two models. One model that says what happens uh, under no treatment. One model that happens what happens under uh, treatment effects. And then you can you get the difference. That's your effect. So that's the way kind of people people in machine learning approach this type of causal models. What was the name again? Kate, conditional average treatment effects. It's uh, or some people call it tau estimator. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So standing between you and uh, networking and drinks is uh, the people of Graphcore. We hope to keep you entertained for the next thirty minutes. Um, so. Um, Graphcore is a company founded five years ago to change, or more seven years ago, to change the way we think about hardware for AI. It turns out it's a coincidence that there's a graph here in Graph Neural Network, but it's actually not a coincidence, as you'll see, um, because of the way we set up to, to change about how uh, computing hardware. So we came, uh, whoops, sorry. Um, we started in a world where there were CPUs and GPUs. And what's a CPU? A CPU is a small amount of arithmetic, increasingly more, and more arithmetic today, um, surrounded by uh, lots and lots of memory. What's a GPU? A GPU is lots and lots of arithmetic units operate on wide words, or lar do large floating point computations. It's easy to add more flops to a CPU or a GPU, the problem is not all of the computations we want to do are large, massive matrix multiplies. Some of them, for example, in graph deep learning, um, uh, uh, comprise smaller blocks of computation, which you want to interleave with the memory of your hardware. And as I say, it wasn't that graph core was designed for graph neural networks. It was just that it was obvious that you can't depend on everything being a massive matrix multiply. And that's how the, the graph core chip uh, was designed. What is it? I love it. Uh, I came to GraphCore a year ago. Uh, I used to work on the Microsoft Hollow, which is a tiny, tiny device with lots and lots of floating point computation in it, where you have to make every single flop count, and you have to make get the maximum efficiency out of your hardware. So what is the GraphCore uh, IPU? It's 1,500 super powerful 640 kilobyte processors. So 1,500 relatively small processors. 640 kilobytes doesn't sound like a lot unless you're my age, uh, in which case who could need more? Um, but it's 640 kilobytes of SRAM, which means that the chips running at six threads on each core get one cycle access to the SRAM. So if you want a sort of a comparison of the IPU versus GPU, the threads on the IPU have way more fast memory. The other thing the IPU has that existing processors doesn't, the thing the IPU doesn't have that existing processors do have is uh, a load of what I call nonsense. Uh, nonsense is things like caches, which try to guess when you want your data put into SRAM, or uh, communications buses where you have to say, uh, where you have packets saying, oh, I've got this letter and I'd like it sent over there. The communications bus in the IPU is entirely timing based. We agree beforehand that 17 clock cycles after the sixth point, I will start speaking. And I will speak for 46 clock cycles. And then somebody else will start speaking for the next 23 clock cycles. This is clearly optimally efficient because there's nothing else going on on the bus except the data that you want to communicate. It's also clear that you need to know ahead of time what you're going to say, not what you're going to say, but how long you're going to say it. Of course, it's, uh, the most of our workloads are static. We do have matrix multiplies. Even when you're doing graph neural networks, you have uh, objects of the same size. They're smaller models than they would be in a massive uh, CNN. But for the workloads that we have today, ahead of time compilation is absolutely the way to make the most of your hardware. So I love this hardware because it's hyper efficient. Um, uh, I, I, I can have any useful detail slide, but roughly speaking, the threads on the IPU, I don't know why it does that, have, oh, I know why it does that because I'm touching the screen. Uh, the threads on the IPU have 100 kilobytes each, and the threads on an A100 have 7 kilobytes each. So you keep those 100 kilobytes full, filled, you can do a lot more on, on the IPU. And the IPU, you can be efficient if you've only got four wide 
uh, 70 rather than needing 64 wide uh, for groups of things. So what's, what, what have I just said? The IPU, no caches, no buffers, everything optimally. But you need to make that work. Very clever compiler, which luckily my colleagues at GraphCore have written. Ahead of time compilation, as Matthias mentioned, is increasingly becoming part of the PyTorch uh, TensorFlow JAX ecosystem. Everyone knows that to get maximum four. And of course, it turns out because of PyG and the transform infrastructure, because the way PyG is architected, it's been a great fit. And Hatem will talk uh, a bit more about how, how this hardware uh, fits well with the IPU. Uh, one thing I just want to show you a little more, why is GraphCore called GraphCore, if it's not to do with graph neural networks? It's to do with the... F I'm so sorry about that. It's to do with the fact that when we take framework code, PyTorch or TensorFlow or JAX code, we all know about the computational graph that you form from that code. That computational graph is typically a smallish graph, a thousand nodes. When you distribute your thousand node graph over 1500 little processes, you have the million node graph. So this graph is what our compiler does to the PyTorch or PyG code before running it on the IPU. This is the representation of the ahead of time uh, computate, compilation that, that, that we perform. Uh, finally, uh, one um, <coughs> further piece of advertising for our software people. Um, uh, um, we have this visualizer, which is my favorite way. So what I see here is what each of my 1500 files, or 1500 processes, is doing over time as I do uh, various scatter and gather operations in the GN. So we're seeing each of the processes doing uh, doing work when they're red and um, sometimes waiting for each other to finish work when they're yellow. This is a kind of optimization tool and debugging tool that I find uh, very exciting to see work. So that's my brief introduction to the Graph4 hardware. 1500 machines, uh, lots of ahead of time compilation, optimally efficient. And now Hatem will tell you how that fits in the graph with uh, PyG. Thank you, Andrew. Um, don't worry about following this link, but I'm really excited to announce that we now have official experimental support for PyG. Um, if you go to that link, it'll kind of take you through all the different resources that we've made available. Um, so let's see, what does that really mean? Um, oh, the layout's also messed up in my slides. So. <laughs> oh, uh, so PyG, we know it's, it's the kind of standard, worldwide standard for GNN research. Uh, it's especially in PyTorch. Um, what is PopTorch? It's probably for many people, it might be the first time you've heard this name. Uh, PopTorch is our PyTorch extension library. So it's what we use to, to do all this ahead of time compilation for the graph for IPU. Um, and part of this announcement, uh, is introducing PopTorch geometric, which is kind of another layer that makes it easy to take a PyG model and run it on our hardware. Um, so I've taken this slide from the PyG uh, README. This is the you know the general architecture. Um, maybe not quite 100 percent up to date because of the PyG lib stuff that's that Mateus introduced earlier. Um, but the kind of key idea is that it's a whole ecosystem. It's not just the you know you know message passing on its own and you have to build everything uh, else yourself. You know, it has the data loaders, the, the models and examples are there. Um, and what we've added is, uh, well, first of all, um, we have this partnership with Paperspace where you can run an entire notebook environment. Um, and we've made a specific container that, uh, with all of our PyG demos and lets you access IPUs for free in the cloud. So if you want to try that, follow these links. Um, there'll be links to that later. Um, but those examples kind of will show you how PyG can work on the IPU. Um, but I think one of the things I'm, you know, proud of our work, uh, is the contributions that we've been making back to PyG. Um, um, Mateus claims that the review process is not as fast as he'd like, but I've, I've always been impressed by how quickly I've, you know, our team's been able to get feedback on any contributions we've made and the contributions we've made kind of span you know, a wide variety of kind of general utilities um, that generally make uh, ahead of time compilation for PyG easier to do. Um, it's in our interest, but then there's also some overlap with search projects that we've been involved in. So this HydroNet data set, it's a very interesting data set that's kind of curated by 
one of the national labs in the US, um, which is a you know molecular data set for molecular property prediction from, from geometric structures. Um, and what our library that uh, we've made available provides is sort of fixed size data loaders. I think the, the kind of long-term view is that we see these as very generic. Um, they do kind of integrate quite tightly with our, our PopTorch library, but there's probably certain parts of that that we would like to provide upstream into PyG to make them generally available. Um, and lastly, the I won't get into the details of this, but a huge amount of engineering goes into the whole stack um, of our SDK um, so that everything that works in PyTorch um, is compiled as efficiently as possible to run uh, on the IPU. And so this has been, uh, you know, the work of really measured in years of effort that's kind of coming out, uh, now, which is fantastic to see. Um, so I'll walk through a quick example. Uh, I'll try not to bore everyone. If you haven't looked at PyTorch code before, hopefully it'll be relatively readable. Um, so this is, you know, as Matthias introduced, the sort of modular PyG sort of setup. Um, I have a model. It's, you know, GNN with a couple of convolutional layers. I have a data set. I have a data loader. And I'm going to try to train it, you know, looping over a loader. Fine. Uh, so what I'm just going to introduce is how we would po start porting that for PopTorch. Um, so PopTorch is our ahead of time compiler. We need to kind of capture the whole graph that you want to run on the device. So the first thing we need to do is incorporate the, the loss function, whatever your criterion is into the forward pass of your model. So we've moved that out of the, the, the loop over the, the data loader. Um, the first step. Uh, we then swap out the torch optimizers for our own pop torch optimizer, which is kind of uh, it's an optimizer that's been optimized for IPUs, to put it succinctly. Um, and we also use our model wrapper. So this is the the call there to training model. What that does that sort of triggers a um, the whole graph capture, so that instead of PyTorch executing your model eagerly of kind of one operator at a time. We capture the whole graph and we can run optimizations on that to, to make sure it's, uh, evaluated as efficiently as possible. Uh, so the next thing is the fixed size data loader. So I'll explain a bit more about that a bit later, but we kind of change the, the default, uh, data loading scheme in PyG and result in, uh, batches that kind of vary in size, which, uh, is not something that, uh, plays nicely with ahead of time compilation. So we need to know the, the sizes of all the tensors you're going to use in your model um, at the time that you know we compile it for the device. Um, and that's you know something that's also true if you're using the PyTorch 2.0 uh, compile functionality for, for PyG. Um, and lastly, this is kind of uh, a minor thing, but some layers that have this uh, option to include incorporate self loops in the the, the sparse adjacency matrix. Um, we need to remove those from the model because the the way that's implemented um, sort of dynamically changes the the size of the tensors depending on the data. So again, that's not something that can be supported in an ahead of comp ahead of time compilation model. Um, so there's a simple fix for this: is you you remove it from the model, but just put it in the the data preprocessing pipeline as a transform. So hopefully that's not too daunting. Um, Oh, have we frozen? There we go. Oh, if that is too daunting, um, you can also organize your code and to use PyTorch Lightning. And we have IPU integration directly into PyTorch Lightning. Um, and those sort of rewrites that I mentioned of kind of incorporating the loss, that's sort of something you have to do anyway if you want to use PyTorch Lightning. Um, we also have uh, kind of lightweight monitoring integrated if you use tools like uh, weights and biases. Um, which might be of interest for anyone using that. Um, so I mentioned the mini batching, and I, I think uh, to kind of dive into this a bit more of exactly what it means. When you think of either you know molecular graphs where you're taking lots of small graphs and batching them together, or if you're doing some kind of uh, sampling techniques on large graphs, what you end up having is uh, a bunch of sort of sparse uh, adjacency matrices that you kind of stack into a block diagonal structure like this. Um, and each time you kind of go through the data set, um, you might get kind of different size batches in this kind of sparse uh, block diagonal ma matrix representation. 
And yeah, so that's great. It's very simple. You don't need to change the model. It supports kind of um, heterogeneity across your data set. Um, and there's no no real overhead when you're you're running entirely eagerly. Um, but sadly, doesn't work for ahead of time compilation. Probably keep saying that over and over. But uh, so what's the fix for that? I'm not, I'm not actually sure what this is. Yeah, there we go. Um, so this is what we provide in Popcorn Geometric is this kind of idea of an elastic sort of padding graph that um, we collect some statistics over your data set and then work out uh, what a kind of reasonable batch size is and kind of always inject the sort of padding graph. Uh, so this sort of picture hopefully makes that clear that the boxes are all the same. The padding graph changes to make sure that the, it fills up the, the, the sort of block diagonal structure to, to a maximum known size. Um, there are more advanced schemes that are possible, but it's kind of uh, something that we're we're kind of continually refining. Um, okay, so the we heard in kind of the earlier talks how you know message passing is really the the kind of core kernel that you you need for GNMs. Um, so obviously the the kind of main question we need to answer is how good are graph core IPUs? Uh, at message passing. So, to give you an I guess some intuition over how these schemes work, um, this diagram is kind of taken from one of our tutorials, uh, which just shows the sort of message passing scheme in in general. Of kind of, uh, your, I think of it as you're sending vectors from uh, a, within a neighborhood uh, to a receiving node, and you need to somehow sum them up. Or kind of aggregate them together. Uh, so if you like equations, um, you have these learnable functions that, uh, represent both the, the, the message, which take the features that you're trying to, to combine, and you have a way of updating. And what's important to note is that the, the memory access is kind of irregular. It's not very cache friendly for systems that depend on caches and cache hierarchies for moving data through. Um, and, but the, the learnable functions are also kind of, a um, will tend to involve sort of dense matrix multiplies if you have something like an MLP in there. Um, so this is obviously challenging because you have kind of a mixture of sort of sparse regular memory access and, uh, kind of swapping back into sort of dense regular coalesced memory access. So that's very hard for hardware. Uh, so to give you kind of a clear intuition of what that means to kind of start the message passing scheme. You have a gather step where you imagine you have kind of a, a table of your, your vectors and um, uh, the, the sort of receivers of those messages. Uh, and yeah, given those, these kind of mocked up uh, receiver indices, we can kind of color our uh, embedding table and we just kind of select them that way. Um, so you can kind of, uh, view this as basically a communication operation. You kind of have, um, a bunch of source vectors you need to send them somewhere else. And in PyTorch, uh, that's the, the index select operator, if you kind of know that at that level. Um, and so what we can do is design a benchmark where we sweep over, uh, Changing the, all the number of inputs, which are the number of nodes, um, and while also varying the number of outputs. And then the last dimension is how big are the vectors that you're sending around. Um, so we end up with this kind of performance surface. It's the best way to describe this. So on the left, it shows, um, all the results kind of comparing IPU to the A100, um, where we varied the, the hidden size. Um, when the X and Y axes show the, the, the kind of number of nodes and number of edges being varied. Um, on the right is the kind of mean speed up. So we see kind of approaching up to 8x, depending on the, the size of the, the dimension of the problem. Um, so that's good. That's just the gather step. So you can imagine in a message passing scheme, you do a gather, you apply some, uh, some aggregation function after that. So that's what we'll look at next. Uh, so scatter reduce again is kind of you have this sort of table view, um, 
bunch of indices that, that we can then color, and then we need to kind of reduce by color effectively. Um, and so in other frameworks, this might be like an aggregate by key operation where you need to, um, you'll have, you know, different numbers of uh, vectors that you need to aggregate depending on the, the sort of degree of those nodes. And there we go. So this builds on, um, well, I guess the, the now upstream torch scatter uh, functionality. Uh, so that will uh, we, yeah, set up the same sort of benchmark where we kind of vary all those. And we get a very similar looking curve, but interestingly, um, the sort of mean speed up is a bit higher. Um, and the last figure I'll show is where we put it all together. So the green curve is looking at the what's the Schnepp uh, message passing network, which is used for quantum chemistry problems. Um, and we can see a sort of mean speed up you know, around 5x, basically. So putting it all together, we were able to kind of accelerate the whole workload by quite a significant margin um, by using graphical IPUs. Um, so that's just kind of one kind of snapshot of different research applications. Um, if you go to uh, any of these links, you can kind of see the sort of breadth of examples that we have um, that you can try and experiment with on paper space. Um, but I guess the important thing to note is that it's a complete development environment. So if you want to develop your own models and do your own experiments uh, using that kind of setup system, you can do that based on these tutorials and examples that we have. Uh, and another thing I'd like to call out for everyone is that we'll be also hosting a PyG town hall um, with our very own Adam Sanders and Ariana, who are around somewhere. And say hello to them uh, at the drinks later. And with that, I'll hand over to Dom, who will tell us about some of the different research highlights that we've had for GNNs. All right. So yeah, I'm uh, Dominic Masters. Uh, I'm part of the research team and responsible for a lot of the uh, GNN work uh, at Graphcore. And I had the privilege of leading one of the teams that we that we had to enter uh, this OGB large scale challenge. Uh, and so the idea is to tell you a little, a little bit about some success stories that we've had um, in doing this, and hopefully show people that you know Andrew's shown us that we've got some cool hardware that does some cool stuff. Had some shown us that we got that the software support is great and really easy to use, and uh, I'll hopefully show you that it can be practical and useful, and hopefully inspire some people to think that oh, maybe it can speed up their uh, their applications too. Um, okay, so if I can, all right. So what am I going to tell you about? Uh, so first of all, tell you a little bit about what this challenge is, uh, and we really focus on uh, as someone competing, as teams competing, what are the major challenges that we felt like there were to, to these competitions and then explain a little bit about how we overcame those and managed to win two out of three, two of the, of the challenges at this, uh, OGB large scale challenge. Okay. So what is this, uh, uh this, this, uh, OGB large scale challenge I keep talking about? So it started off with this, uh, open graph benchmarks group, uh, which originally started in 2020. Actually, I should thank, uh, some of us at URA and Mateus. Who were both heavily involved in all of this stuff and, uh, really thank you. We had a really good time competing on this and, uh, these kind of, uh, initiatives I think are so important to, to research. So, uh, yeah, would, uh, absolutely recommend other people to get involved. Uh, but it started off with four, 14 graph data, uh, data sets, um, that have been really well used. Uh, one of the things that was identified there is that maybe they, they weren't necessarily as big as, uh, we expect. They weren't, you know, they weren't as big as kind of image net sizes and we see data set sizes growing so much. Uh, and that really helps. Uh, with the, uh, the scale of the models that people want to, to build. And we know that data set scale is a really massive thing in terms of getting the best performing models. So in 2021, uh, they released these three new data sets, which are called the large scale challenge. Uh, and uh, accompanying that, they had a formal, kind of a formal competition. This was first run in 2021. Um, uh, and the second iteration of this was held at uh, NeurIPS last year. It's got three data sets, and the idea is that they kind of span a wide range of subjects that they're meant to be useful, and they're really about helping to push the state of the art in graph machine learning. So the first one is a, a graph uh, a graph level prediction task, um, where we're going to try and predict 
So you're going to have some molecules. And essentially, you want to predict this quantum chemistry, uh, chemistry uh, property, the homo lumo gap, very important in drug discovery and things like that. Uh, so, which I think is very useful itself as a, as a task, but it's also a good proxy for other kind of molecular tasks or other small uh, GNN tasks. Um, we've got a link level task, which is uh, essentially a knowledge graph where, where, where the problem is we've got some um, information like, oh, you know, Jed Pinton was born, graduated from X. And uh, often these knowledge, uh, these knowledge graphs, they're incomplete. So we want to be able to predict some links that aren't there. Uh, and then this final one, which is a node level task, uh, which is about having, uh, dealing with really large, um, uh, really large graphs and trying to predict some property of those nodes. So, uh, from GraphCore, we decided to submit to two of those. So the graph level task, which I was responsible for with that in collaboration with Valence, uh, Valence Discovery, uh, who are a drug discovery startup, uh, that spun out of Mila and Mila itself. Uh, and then we also submitted to this link level task. And we will leave the other one for future work. I think that's something we might like to do in the future. Uh, and I think we were, uh, unbelievably couldn't believe the fact that we managed to win both of those. So I guess the big question is, what was our secret source? Why, you know, how do we manage to do that? And hopefully, uh, be able to give you some insights into, into that. So to dig a bit deeper into the tasks. So we've got this graph prediction, prediction task where it essentially, it's, so it's quantum chemistry. We, we, we've got to predict this scalar. Um, floating point property, uh, the Homo Luma gap. And really to, to calculate this with, um, first principle methods, it can be, you know, kind of min minutes per molecule. So if you're trying to do thousands of those, that could be an hour's worth of compute. And we want to replace that with super quick deep learning and do those in, you know, a microsecond. Uh, the data set size is just under four million molecules and performance is measured by just the mean absolute error of this Homo Luma gap. Uh, and the only other, um, uh, rule they have associated with this, uh, with this task is, is that you have to be able to do all the inference over a test set, which is, uh, 300,000 molecules in under four hours. And that's just to stop you from cheating and just doing the first principle methods and getting the answer straight from that. So what were the challenges? So the, the whole competition, uh, took was over about three or four months. And in a, in a competition environment, you know, you have to move fast. You have to be able to work fast, uh, because everyone's got the same amount of time. How do you make sure that you can do better? You know, you can do better than the other people in the competition. Um, there is so much stuff in the literature and some of those things are just things that you have to integrate. You know, there's just the, you know, the kind of de facto methods that you know are useful, you know, whether it's like dropout or other regularization techniques or, um, uh, ensembling, all these kind of things that you just have to integrate. And it's, there's a lot of work to do that. Um, there are just so many choices. You know, the, the space of bottles that you can try and, uh, try and test out is extremely large. Everyone knows that you have to try and make informed decisions, but inevitably you have to test a lot of things. Uh, and on top of that, there's not just the choices in the architecture, but then you've got all the high parameters. So, um, it's really, uh, a very iterative process where you really need to be able to run things, um, test a lot of things. And then we also have the problem with machine learning as it is, is that everything changes day to day. Uh, the state of the art changes and you've got to be ready to integrate the newest, uh, the newest papers in the, in the drop of a hat. So, uh, being flexible, being agile and being able to move quickly is, is, is such an important thing. So just to get, I, I don't want to go through all of the, uh, various choices you make, uh, cause that would take a long time, but I'm going to talk about one of the main, most important ones. And that's about the model architecture. I think this is a question that a lot of people have around graph uh, machine learning minute, this idea of uh, you know, you've got message, either kind of classical or the, the message passing algorithms that are used across pretty much, uh, all graph machine learning. And now transformers are often being used. And actually transformers, um, there's been a really large swing in molecular, uh, machine learning to transformers. So this is the biggest, one of the biggest questions. So what are the advantages of message passing? Well, we really get to leverage the inductive bias. You know, the, there is a lot of information in the graph and we want to leverage that information. So there's real benefit in doing that. Um, there's also, uh, uh, a real benefit in the cost as the, uh, uh as the graph grows, the cost, uh, the, the cost of running it only scales with the size of the graph. Uh, uh, and also what we get to do is we get to do special things. We get to actually model edge properties themselves. Um, and now that gives, you know, it, it essentially promotes edges for first class citizen, uh, uh, of our model. And that can, that can represent data in a way that you may not be able to do, uh, with a transformer. In terms of the downsides, 
Um, there's some well documented issues with training, like I think that, that's uh, you know kind of over smoothing and over squashing. I think those these are not problems you can't overcome, uh, and uh, a different for different different uh, different problems. And there's this, there's this kind of perspective that um, GNNs can be computationally difficult. So gather and scatter, uh, gather and scatter costs um, can be high. Uh, and often you get lots of very small map models, which don't necessarily parallelize very well on your GPU. Now, as Hatem has just told you, they actually run really great on, uh, on IPUs. So that, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get rid of that uh, as, a, as a downside. Now, from the transformer side of things, uh, you do, there are some real benefits to be able to leverage what other people have done. But it's been successful in a whole range of areas. So you get to leverage the, the, uh, uh, the kind of domain expertise. It decouples the, the compute structure from the, the graph structure. There is, you know, that's, there's definitely some, uh, potential benefits in doing that. And it directly handles, uh, long range interactions. Um, however, it needs to learn to understand graph structure, uh, which is difficult. Um, uh, so it means you've got to, you've got to be able to learn what a graph is and what that is. And we already know that information. So it's not something you want to, you want to have to learn. And edges are not considered as a primary entity. You know, the in, in a molecule, you have well, the the bond in between atoms. It means something. So we want to be able to model that property, and, and that hopefully that can give us some couple of minutes. Okay. Well, <laughs> um, and also it, it doesn't scale so well with the uh, number of nodes. Now, what are the approach that we took is to try and take the best of both worlds here. So to take a hybrid approach uh, where we do a bit of me uh, message passing and a bit of transformer, uh, and we think that's a, a, a uh, a sensible thing to do. So, uh, in terms of overcoming those challenges, we really saw um, speed as the most important thing in terms of uh, in terms of our success. So, from the from the very start, we were engineered everything to be as fast as we could. Um, so, we focused on uh, distributed training. So, we want to be able to to scale to at least sixteen IPUs and uh, 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 and run things as quick as we can. Uh, doing things in low precision to maximize uh, the the flop rate that we can get, um, and on all the other things you do to 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 optimize the speed. Um, there was a lot of software challenges, and I think that's something that, uh, it, particularly as, a, as an early adopter in, the, in, in these kind of challenges, um, you always have to go through that. But you know, as we've shown with our PyG support and a lot of the Kumo things, that's really great to see the software support because that can really make it easier for, for other people to get involved. Um, and also, um, the general benefits of the IPUs were really important to us. So for GNN models that could often be very bottlenecked by these gather scatter costs, uh, it's not a problem for us. Uh, and what's important is that it didn't just speed up our really big models, it actually also sped up our small models. And that's something you often don't see with GPUs. If you, as you scale your model down, you don't get all the benefit. Even though there's much fewer flops, you don't always get that benefit. And that's something that we found uh, with IPUs was really beneficial. Uh, so in terms of speed, the exact speed comparisons are really hard to make because uh, there's often a lot of a lot of things and we, uh, uh, a lot of things to test. But we think for our kind of best case model, we we're, we're about five times faster for comparable systems. And we think for our smaller model, even more than that. So uh, when you're doing a lot of runs, that makes a huge amount of difference. So I want to tell you a little bit of story about what our progress looks like. So here I have a plot. This is every single run we did in our development. Uh, and this tells you what the, the validation MAE was. So lower is better all the way up to the point where we have to submit our, submit our results. And the coloring is the size of our model. Uh, and what you see is, is that, uh, we really leveraged using, doing lots and lots of tests on much smaller models than our biggest one. So right at the start, you see everything was only kind of maybe two or three million parameters. And that meant we can move really, really quick. And we were doing, you know, hundreds of models. Uh, 100 results, again, like hundreds of results every night, which as a researcher is amazing, right? You know, you, you set something off and you come back and you go, okay, right, I understand where I am and I can make the next steps. Um, and then even as we got to our much bigger, uh, our absolute biggest models, they were still only about a day, about a day to run. And that's kind of a, you know, a perfect time. Uh, you know, even for the biggest models, it's as a researcher, if you have to wait a week for your training, training one to come back, it's frustrating. So, uh, speed is a really important, uh, part of that. And um, so for this first half, you're going to see a gradual decrease down. That's where we were uh, really focusing on our message passing model and made a lot of progress there. Um, and then the second bit after, you know, kind of midway through September, we decided, you know, that's the point where we started trying to integrate some transformers and 3D positional information. And that kind of shot us down to our 
for our final uh, final results. And this is uh, over 6,000 models trained in total. Um, and I guess another another problem you see, I've got a red line that shows what the published SOTA was at that time. And you can see how much it changed just in the time of, of doing that. And actually, uh, this last the, the last drop, um, some of the innovations in that paper really helped us improve our own model. So integrating all those all those all those uh, features as they come was really really important. Okay. Um, okay. So what did we build in the end? We built this hybrid GPS plus plus model. Uh, there's lots of you know we did lots of feature engineering, which I'm not going to talk too much about. And you see in the middle we've got this message passing and attention block. That that's our main processing. We do that multiple times, uh, 16 times in total. And the, but the bit I really want to draw your attention to is this cut out in the top right. This is what our MPN looked like. And uh, we found that we built something much more complex than uh, a lot of other people in the literature. Uh, and every one of these colored lines is a gather or scatter. So these are the kind of operations that other people would avoid doing uh, because they would be expensive. And uh, we really had the flexibility to do exactly what we wanted and follow, uh, follow the results of our data and do something, um, yeah, and be creative. Uh, and I really put that as one of the main reasons that we uh, we got such good performance. Okay, so what do our results look like? Um, so I'm gonna, if you look at this table in the top right, uh, see a whole list of other, uh, other models that are the kind of prior art. And, uh, as you can see, our GPS plus plus model is not just, give it, doesn't just give us the best valid MAE. It's also actually quite a bit smaller, uh, and more efficient in terms of the parameters than the other models. Uh, and I really put that down to leveraging the inductive bias of a graphs for the message pack, passing network and, um, now, the model, the model two above it, actually that's the case where we decide, we, we decide to ablate what would happen if we didn't do our transformer. And actually, it surprised all of us with just how good it was. And I think, uh, for us, this really, uh, suggested there's a lot of legs in, uh, in the message passing for these kind of models. I know there's a lot of enthusiasm for transformers, and I'm sure there'll be cases where for graphs they're beneficial. Uh, but I'm definitely on team message passing. I think it's the, the right, uh, the right algorithm to use for these kind of, uh, these kind of tasks. Um, in total, I think compared to the, the best G, uh, transform model, uh, running on a GPU, we think we're at least three times faster than those. And again, that's really beneficial for, for everything you want to do. Um, and even more, our inference was so quick that, uh, we could have a 112 model ensemble at the end, which was, you know, most people would say is a pretty, pretty serious amount of uh, compute we're doing. But, uh, even with that really large ensemble, um, our, uh, our inference time was well within the four hour budget that we were given as part of the competition. Um, and what you see this table at the, uh, at the bottom right, this is the final results. Um, as you can see, we love graphs, as I hope everyone else is here. Uh, and as you can see, we beat some really well established, um, uh, like Microsoft in the video. And I think that's something that for a small team, yeah, we're super proud of. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna, okay. Yeah. So, um, if anyone else, please just, have a look at our, our paper for any of, the, any of the details. And yeah, I think we can skip it. I think we can skip at that one. And yeah. Uh, so the other, so, uh, in the interest of time, we did it. We did also do really well at this link prediction task. Um, I'll skip to the results. If you have questions about that, please, please come and ask us. Uh, where's Daniel? Daniel's the guy that, uh, did, one of the guys that did a lot of the work here at the back. Ask him all your questions if you're interested in knowledge graphs. Um, and yeah, in terms of conclusions, I can't stress enough how much iterating fast was really important to us and our success. And I think that's a really big part of our, uh, part of why we did well. Um, software and hardware choices make a really big impact to that. I'm really happy to see all the Kumo work. I think it's really important and the PyG and how software can really help and hardware, uh, hardware choices has a really big role to play in that. And we hope that, uh, yeah, people are interested and want to see IPUs. Um, yeah, and while I think we felt like we were kind of early adopters and we had to build a lot of stuff ourselves, I uh, hope that's not the case for everyone, uh, as these kind of software packages, uh, get better. Okay. I think that's it for the, for the slides. I think there's a, so, um, as, as, as Hatem said before, we've got all these great GNN notebooks. Uh, you can run off the paper space. We give you six hours free on paper space. So, you know, you can go on there, try it for free, uh, run on IPUs. Uh, you can build your, you know, test your own model on there. So we really want people just to go out and try stuff. And we really hope that this kind of inspires some people to go and test them. I think that's it. Andrew.
Thank you. So those of you uh, looking at the schedule will know we have scheduled some time now for uh, discussion and more Q&A. So let's do that. Let's maybe not go to the full 7.30 and make sure we get the sunset. Um, we weren't sure what the weather was going to be like. So uh, any questions now for uh, any of the last few speakers or in general observations? Oh, we have uh, we have a benchmark NVIDIA H100 compared to your uh, IPU. Uh, we haven't had access to the hardware yet. Because on your website, you have comparison uh, NVIDIA V100 compared to some your uh, IPU. It's a big difference, but later, no information. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, look, everything's leapfrogging each other all the time, right? The point is, you know, we are confident that for people with graph neural network problems of the kind we've discussed, you should buy our stuff on paper space. I'm very happy to tell my friends to do that. You were yeah. saying H100. Yeah, all the benchmarks went to A100. So, you know, we really are trying to test it is the state of the art GPUs that you can get now. Uh, I've very much like to test them against H100s, but. Yeah. Uh, um, so of the three different test types available in the be in big benchmark, uh, could you provide some insight into why you chose graph level and link level predictions or those better suited for your tech stack? Or was there something else? Uh, so I think the, yeah, uh, so, so I think in terms of the small graph problems, it's, they they can be kind of easier to, to, to run, you know, in the sense that it looked a lot like your, your classic machine learning problem. You're going to back the whole of the data and run it. And, uh, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's, you know, and one of the, some of the biggest problems are those costs around things like gathers and scatters and things like that. And we thought that was a, yeah, a great place to kind of show, to show off, uh, what we could do. Uh, and kind of a, a similar thing with the, the, the knowledge graphs that, um, you know, we had some nice ideas about how we could kind of distribute this, distribute the work. It, I, I must say for the no prediction one, I think uh, there's no, there'd actually be no problem in running it. If I'm honest, it's just a lot of work for a small team. Uh, and, uh, you know, picking, if we had to, if we had to prioritize two out of three, that was those sort of ones that we wanted to do. But yeah, I'd like, you know, really like to try the, the, the no prediction test as well. Um, so it's like really beyond me to understand these low level architectures when I'm coding. Uh, hopefully people can relate to this. So I usually have like a mental model of what's right to do. So for example, if I'm running on a GPU, I might not mind doing some more multiplications. And if I'm running on a CPU, I wouldn't do that. So is there a mental model that's useful to have when working with an IPU? Cause I guess that would allow you to, to, to write the right code. <laughs> Sure, yeah. I think uh, well, Andrew's got some points. I mean, I'll just say you don't need your matrices to be so big to make, to get peak flops. You know, that's the, as, as Dom said a few times, small models run fast and big models run fast. And that's just, it's a little bit more freeing. And, and I think, you know, we've got this really great, um, high bandwidth memory on chip and it's just maximized the benefit of doing it. Is, yeah, I think is a, you know, uh, is a really good way to think about it. So, can you give some intuition on why the larger the graph gets, the speed up gets smaller? Uh, I'm just not able to. Uh, compared to, compared to, uh, new, uh, GPUs, why does the speed up get smaller the larger the, the graph? What's the intuition there? I think it's the same intuition. GPUs have evolved to be good at big, um, big work, right? So, Yes, but the actual matrix that the GPU sees is bigger. So, I think I'd disagree that necessarily as the, the, the performance does get worse as model size gets bigger, as the, as the graph size gets bigger. Um, but I think he's, I think he's saying on, on Hatem's graph, the speed up. The speed ah, okay. The speed, so the speed up. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yes. So yeah, that makes sense. One more, right. <laughs> uh, do you have a library for uh, virtualization if you use multiple uh, IPU, for example? Oh, 
So, um, so you mean so you can run it without having the hardware there itself? Yeah, no, because uh, for example, uh, if Nvidia use uh, A100, they use NVLink. Mm -hmm. Compare four or eight together, it's a hardware solution and speed up, right? Yeah. But uh, they don't have uh, virtualization. If you have, for example, multiple server, right? And to use multiple cores, multiple GPU. In case of uh, IPU, your IPU, we provide library for or software is the key for virtualization. You use like uh, multiple IPU, like one. Uh, yes, Andrew, you, you... Yeah, I think the answer is yes. The uh, the compiler can be configured to look at sixteen or sixty four IPUs at the same time. And, and to plan the program across all the IPUs. So it can treat them as a massive, yeah, 64 different IPUs. Uh, compile time will go up. So sometimes you instead do a sort of classic replica or a classic uh, virtualization. I apologize if this is so naive, but um, so what is the compute model? Is there uh, native IPUs that you're using, or is it like, so is it used as an accelerator or? Uh, so, yes, yeah, so in, in a similar way to a GPU, you've got a CPU, a CPU kind of doing data loading and all those kind of things that the CPU is really great for. And then you're going to offload your, offload your data and then you're going to do all this machine learning stuff that you want to have a specific accelerator for. So it, it, it looks quite similar to a GPU setup in that, in that sense. Right, I think I can hear thirst in the audience. So, um, um, uh, thank you all very, very much for coming to our offices. Uh, very pleased to have you here, and thank you so much, uh, Matthias and Yure, for for joining us in this event. Thank you.